Welcome, everybody, to Radio Dead Air Tech Q&A. You've got questions. We've got guesses. It's where we answer your tech questions and attempt to help you with various and sundry little issues regarding things that go beep. Um, I am Nash. I do RDA, and I've got well over a decade's worth of experience with tech and tech repair. Uh, my producer, Mike, very similar cred credentials. We've got a lot to cover, as always, this week. Oh, and we're coming back to this one again to start us off with. Which one again is this? Uh, the FCC story. Ah, yes. You know, we were trying to tell people about this eight years ago, six years ago. This, this was very big. Yeah, six years ago. Um, the whole net neutrality thing. And people have so quickly forgot because, well, we've had net neutrality. But, and, and people I, d don't even accuse me of scaremongering when the stated intent is the death of net neutrality. Um, uh, Ajit Pai, I'm sure, yeah. pretty sure fairly soon we're all going to know how to say his name. Um, I think I think you're you're reasonably close. He's uh, one of the the highest ranking Republican member of the FCC, which I want to point out is not an elected position. It is an appointed position. So it's entirely based on who the president nominates the position, who Congress confirms. Um, the, the quick way the FCC works is there's five people on the panel, five commissioners. Currently, two Republicans. Yes, yes, train. Two Republicans, two Democrats, and the fifth person is whatever party the president's in. Yeah. Now, uh, Ajit Pai uh, is on the record as saying the following um, uh, regarding net neutrality. I do believe its days are numbered today. I'm more confident than ever that this production prediction will come true. I'm hopeful that beginning next year, our general regulatory approach will be a more sober one that is guided by evidence, sound economic analysis, and a good dose of humility. Yes, I don't know that he knows what those words mean. No. Um, why I keep bringing this up is... People are not appreciating or have forgotten why this is a big deal. I want to try to explain to you why losing net neutrality is very, very bad for all of us. Net neutrality is the principle that states, um, whether it's a large website like YouTube or a small personal website, whichever one you try to access, will both come to you at the best possible available network speed. Now, that may not be fast depending on the small website's connection to the internet. It could be you know, right. relatively slow, but it's not going to be any slower once it gets past their small pipe. Right. It's like, you know, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's not, it's entirely dependent upon network conditions and not artificially induced conditions, which is what uh, uh, opponents of net neutrality want. What they want to be able to do is determine how fast uh, traffic reaches a potential customer of an internet service provider, depending on what they want to charge. Yes. Not on network conditions, but on how much extra they can tack on. For So now who bears the cost entirely depends on up to the ISP. A few years ago, I think you'll remember, uh, Netflix and Comcast had a wonderful little dispute over uh, data being carried from across Comcast network to users. Comcast yeah. users who wanted to use Netflix. This is the important part. Right. It, it wasn't Comcast going, uh, these are uh, Time Warner users over here using our pipes to get Netflix. No, it's using Time Warner pipes sort of deal uh, it was their customers going these are things we want to see 
And Comcast was telling Netflix, look, our customers want to see your stuff so much. You should pay us more. You keep in mind, of course, the Comcast customers, Comcast customers, well, it's kind of hard to say sometimes. Yeah. Uh, we're paying already. Yes. And in some cases, or, uh, paying quite exceptional amounts for quite, quite crap internet. Yeah. Net neutrality is in a set is in essence, double dipping. It yes. can be. If you charge the content provider to transport data across your network and you charge your customers to receive that data, you're getting paid twice for the same data. Yeah. Now, if, and this is a really big if, if it were the case that the Comcast of the world were <clears throat> using this money to improve their networks, we'd still be probably upset about it, mm -hmm. but we wouldn't necessarily be quite as upset because they'd be going, oh, we need to build out to support this. We need to make bigger, faster, better networks so people can get, but they're not. They're not. They're taking this money and they're going, these are people who own our stock. We'll give them money. Yeah, if you look at ISP buildouts over the past few years, those have slowed considerably. Fios yeah, well, is slowed down. Uh, Google Fiber, because, well, Comcast and everyone else is challenging them in court. Yeah. And the, and the fiber is the fiber slowdowns have occurred also in part because the companies want to switch over to wireless, yeah. high speed wireless, which I'm not inherently in favor of. Me either. Uh, not because it's, it, it can be just as fast. The reason they want to do it is because they don't have to put in as much infrastructure. The problem with high-speed wireless, it is very subject to environmental conditions. Yeah, well, we're getting off the top, top, topic. Yes, we're though. getting off the, yeah. So, yes, this is, this is uh, net neutrality uh, unless strange things happen where whoever Trump appoints are actually net neutrality supporters. Uh, that's police sirens now. That happens occasionally. <laughs> Usually, I mean, the last few times the, the train went by, you didn't notice. and But this time, I didn't change any settings here. What, what, at, at the end of the day, <clears throat> what the death of net neutrality means is you are going to be paying more for what for you, same thing. for the same thing. Whether you pay Comcast directly, if Comcast sets up what's called fast lanes, if they say, hey, you can get your internet, but if you want to get your internet at a timely speed, you got to pay extra for these sites. And maybe we just won't allow the traffic from these sites at all. Yeah. Now, um, the, so the Republican response on this is, well, if they didn't have this net neutrality in place, they would build out their networks more. We're about to see two to four years, depending on what happens, hmm. uh, four, more likely four to eight years, depending on what happens, we well, seeing if that's actually going to be true. It's not. So we'll, it's not. Well, but there are going to be plenty of people who go, well, here's four years they had this, they didn't have this. Obviously, you were wrong. So that's going to be the evidence that we can throw in yeah. Azure so, High Space. So either the money will go to your ISP, or if the ISP decides they're not going to charge customers. They're going to charge providers setting up a nice little extortion racket. That's a nice website there. Be ashamed if anything happened to it. They're going to charge providers. Providers are going to pass the charges on to customers. So one way or another, you're going to be paying more for your internet services for the exact same thing you got before with no benefit to you. At all. Just benefit to your ISPs who are effectively getting money for free for doing nothing. For not and, and I, I swear to God, I saw the phrase business innovation used. Uh business innovation. That, that that I believe that translates as to uh someone has found a new way to screw the customers out of money. Yes, that yeah, business in a fuck invasion. So it's going to be rough. Um, let's look at this, uh, yet another business innovation. And you know what? This this is going to be interesting in the next few years because this, this keeps happening. We are on cusp of a bubble here. Um, you may or may not have heard of a social app called Yik Yak. I remember Yik Yak. I never used Yik Yak. Yik Yak is unique from most social apps in two ways. 
Number one, it's anonymous. There are no usernames or anything. It's just you type whatever you want. It's, it's a great big bulletin board that no one has to take credit for anything. And number two, how these two things together make it unique. Number two is it's based on proximity. So instead of being across the entire internet, Yik Yak works based on the other people close by you who are also using Yik Yak. And I'm assuming it's based off either you tell it sort of where you are through GPS, perhaps, mm -hmm. or it goes off of your IP address and goes, right. ah, that IP is downtown New York. Now, this this has become very popular at places like uh, high schools and colleges. And if you think the combination of being in proximity of people and not having to tell them who you are on a social network sounds like a really bad idea. It kind of was because Yik Yak became used for a whole lot of abuse. Unsurprisingly, uh, it's the... Uh... What is, the, what is it? The internet anonymity rule? Yeah. Audience plus anonymity equals fuckwit? Yeah. So news, but the other thing about Yik Yak that is very common among apps and uh, the tech sector is they had no fucking business model. This is also true. Because it was, the, unless, I mean, unless they're displaying ads, they had no way to really charge for this. If your whole thing is about people being anonymous, how do you charge them without having records of who they are? Yeah, um, news has come in that uh, Yik Yak has dropped its workforce from 50 employees to 20 people, which is over half its workforce. Yeah, that's pretty hefty, but also <clears throat> you look at it and go, okay, so that's a floor of a building to now half a floor of a building. Um, well, to make it even worse, <clears throat> Yik Yak has been valued. This is a company that was 50 people, now 20 people. They claimed a valuation of $400 million. Okay, I'm going to ask the obvious question here. Based the fuck off what? Based off the fact that they had raised... 60 million in venture capital. Okay, so hang on. Because my degree is, is in engineering, <clears throat> I don't have a lot of business necessarily knowledge here other than being exposed to, you know, the people from office space <clears throat> as real life people. Um, venture capital, to my understanding, is people loaning you money. Yes. So you can expand your business. Yes. So they owe $60 million to people who say, we expect our $60 million plus money. Unless we're talking about angel investors, yes. Hang on. Okay, so they owe $60 million plus interest plus whatever the contract says. Hmm. Based off that, they say, we have no income stream. No. And we're worth $400 million. Yes. How do we get in on the scam? <laughs> I've seen quite a few people online today mention that uh, venture cap this has reminded them venture capital seems to resemble a Ponzi scheme. I, I really like to, we we should come up with an app. We should come up with something. I, we don't need to raise sixty. We'll raise twenty million, and we can we can you know declare bankruptcy two years later. We can we can do this. Are, are we reenacting the plot to the producers here? <laughs> Only if we sell more than 100% of the company. So what this means is this is... Yeah, and you, you'll be Nathan Lane. Why am I Nathan Lane? Why are you Matthew Broderick? Isn't it obvious? Back to the story. So what this and other similar financial shenanigans that go along with this sort of thing... This is the tech bubble, people. How a company that has no business model based solely on outside investment has no revenue stream. This company does not make money. 
It is not profitable. There is no money coming in. Say, I, unless they show ads, and I can't see you making sixty million off a, a, a five second ad that someone sees when they start their app. Or four hundred million. The fact that this company is valued at $400 million when it produces nothing, when it brings in nothing, it's just an app, is the tech bubble writ large. There are so many little companies out there and so many big companies out there, Twitter, who have this exact same problem. Well, Twitter brings in some money, but it's not profitable. This is unsustainable. And a very large chunk of our economy is wrapped up in nonsense like this. Perfectly fictional, all, all it exists on paper entirely, which is ironic considering we're talking about the electronic age. Remember paperless offices? Remember when that was going to be a thing? Oh, God, yes. Um, it, it exists entirely on paper. And it's one of many. This cannot continue. This pro I, I remember the last time we had something that existed entirely on paper. Um, that was uh, 2008, financial crisis. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is going to be the next moment our economy might not completely crumble, but it's going to wobble like a motherfucker. It's going to hurt all these little ones going down and all adds up to a bit. It's like it's like that old congressional saying, you know, a million here, a million there. Pretty soon you're talking about real money. And, and when. God, I hate that one. And when in when the, the problem, this is this usually takes a domino effect because. All it's going to need is one big one. One of the big, most notable ones, someone like Twitter, for example, to fall down for the market to be skittish about everything tech related for a long time. And just everything just sort of boom, boom. And that's going to be bad for everybody. Well, I'm just a big old ray of sunshine tonight. Oh, yeah. Well, we have a little bit of good news for consumers, if sort of accidentally. <laughs> um, this is true. If you're a gamer, you may have heard the term de nouveau. Um, de nouveau is a uh, copy protection digital rights management setup. Uh, that's been sold to game producers, game developers over the past few years, and it was touted as being uncrackable. Okay, so, minor segue here. Never, ever, in any computing, engineering, whatever thing, say your system is uncrackable, unbreakable, unsinkable, can't catch on fire, burn down. You know, don't, don't make those statements. Because someone somewhere will take that as a challenge. Yeah, and they did. Uh, Ars Technica notes that uh, a number of uh, video games are slowly removing de nouveau protection from the games. Yep. Uh, Doom being the most uh, notable one, and uh, Play Dead's Inside. Um, both of these I were never cracked. Heard of that one? Yeah. Both of these were cracked. The uncrackable de nouveau was cracked. Now it was a convoluted crack. And each crack, it's not this this is the thing to be aware of. It's not the entire si de nouveau system was cracked. It's de nouveau on this game was cracked. Right. And then de nouveau on this other game was cracked. All of these cracks are going to have to be game specific in order to function properly. Now but because they're able to go, well, we cracked it here on Doom. That gave us a lot of working knowledge on how to crack it on this next game, which gives us a lot of working knowledge how to crack it on the next game. Mm -hmm. As they crack it further and further, they, they'll they'll automate it. They'll speed it up. Some someone who's even brighter than the first group, or just you know, notice something clever, will go, 
hey, if we do this, we can crack it for this set, and so on. And so, uh, it uh, anything you say uncrackable will be cracked. Um, now they've they've also let's see Deus Ex, uh, Mirror's yet. Edge, uh, Rise of the Tomb Raider. They all had Nuba uh, cracked. The what's notable about uh, Bethesda uh, removing. Denuvo from Doom is it could possibly indicate that um, Bethesda has uh, severed their contract with Denuvo and asked for a refund. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I mean, if you if you if you put your your stuff out there saying this is unbreakable, and, and they, if you they break it, we will refund it. And if these if the if this happens with enough, that means that Denuvo is going to be paying back a whole lot of money, and that could endanger their company. Yeah. Nothing is uncrackable. Nothing. No, you should never put any guarantees on your security. Well, no, you you can put guarantees, but don't don't go out there and say it's uncrackable. You, you there, there's plenty of things that have security guarantees that are reasonable. I always find security guarantees over promise. Oh yes, they, 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 they I'd say I agree they quite often do, but you can you cannot overpromise if you can keep the marketing monkeys from doing that. <laughs> well, that's damn near impossible. Um yes, you know. when it comes to that, that that's what four pound hammers are for. When it comes to security, you should never, I, I personally think you should never guarantee. You should say, this is the best defense. Defenses are not impenetrable. But here's why this is the best. Here's what we've got for you. This is the best we can do. And here's and maybe, maybe make some statements, but here's how we're improving it to keep it the best. Yeah. It's, it's, it's one of those things where you cannot ever say, we have the solution because you don't. It's an arms race. All security, no matter if it's electronic, uh, meat space, whatever, it's all constantly an arms race. Yeah. I think the only way for, for DRM you would have a something that stayed uncrackable for a significant length of time uh, is if the games it was being used on were not popular enough that the big teams wanted to crack it. Mm. Someone will. Someone will just for, you know, I've noticed people will will do things with games simply because they can. Oh, yeah, yeah. But if it, you know, something like Doom, you've got a lot of people who want to crack that. Something like, I, I don't know, Peggle. There wouldn't be nearly as many. And yet, Peggle has been cracked. Yes, it has. <laughs> but they also probably didn't use nearly as secure encryption. <laughs> well, no, 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 no. I don't think Peggle really gave a shit about people pirating Peggle. To some degree, but not enough to go, ah, oh, we're throwing everything we got at it. We can't let them have the Peggle crown jewels. We'll lose everything. That Peggle, it's a national treasure. Gotta defend it. Very entertaining for about a week. It was for about a week, yeah. Also, that that bookworm game, that was very entertaining for about a week until I, I just sort of like pulled up a dictionary app and just sort of like boom, 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 and, and just, yeah. That's the Scrabble app and did, yeah, completely undermined the game. We, uh... Because I'm awful. That's cheating. And I cheated. Um, so that's going to do it for news. We've got questions. We have questions. And as always, if you have questions, send them to us. We will do our fumbling best to attempt to answer them for you. And oh, let's start with this one from uh, SSJ Genku. God, I hate these fucking things with a passion. <laughs> I really hate these things. Um, they're right. Hi, Mike. He, and he's, he's not talking about questions or the people who ask them. 
I'm, I'm talking about the subject of this question. Uh, hi, Mike and Nash. I recently acquired a Netgear Powerline 1000 adapter to transition the wireless connection on my gaming console to a wired one. But after noticing a lack of significant improvement and a bit of additional research, I discovered the router that one end of the adapter was plugged into was not on the same circuit as the other. My question is, what can be done short of moving the router itself to the same circuit to improve things? Um, okay, so in, in, in this situation, I'll be honest with you. I'm going to guess what Nash would have done. I know what I would have done is I would just run Cat6 the entire way. Well, let's exp people don't know what this is yet. You have to pa okay. you have to pause, Mike. Don't presume the audience knows. Okay. Um, the Netgear Powerline 1000 and similar products like this. Um, you may have seen these before. What they are is devices to allow you to hardwire your uh, net internet connection across your house by way of your power lines. Your in your house wiring your house power wiring uh what you do is you, you take the device you plug it into a power outlet and then you plug the other end into another power outlet in a different room and in theory the internet will travel over those power lines except if they're not on the same circuit there's some issues yeah, uh, there are a lot of issues in using house wiring as internet, and th these were always sketchy in this regard. Um, for and one, Netgear, which is even sketchy to begin yeah. with. For one thing, you're depending on your house wiring, which depends on whoever built your house, and electrical wiring is not rated for nor advised to be used for network traffic. Yeah. And now part of the reason, of course, is unless your house is brand new, hmm. uh, the wiring in there is uh, uh, most likely most houses these days, you know, it's you look at 10, maybe 15, 20 year old wiring. So it's perfectly fine for you know, conducting regular electricity, but there's enough, you know, solder connections, whatever, that you're just losing signal resolution right effectively uh jumping through all those things so yeah you may be getting the speed you want but it's having to retransmit every third packet because they're so corrupted when they come through that it's going oh, i don't know what this is yeah there, there's there's a reason we don't just use um electrical cable like in any appliance as networking cable there's a reason we don't do this it's because just a plain old copper wire is a shitty means of transmitting data. Now, it's perfect. It, we use this for, uh, for, for network traffic, like the coax cable from uh, Comcast. But co they also have shielding, they have braiding, they have a whole lot of electronics between there and here to make sure the signal reaches you. Just a regular old wire is not good enough. It's always going to cause issues. Um, and the second thing that was brought up in the question, what Mike was talking about is not every power circuit in the house is directly connected to every other power circuit in the house. They go to the switch box from different cables, different lines in the walls, they're not ideal. And because they're not on the same circuit, they have to go a whole long damn different way to come back and talk to the other thing. And the, the, the way you tell if it's on the same circuit, by the way, if you don't mind, you know, randomly flipping the breakers in, in your house. Yeah. Is you find the breaker for one end of the thing and turn it off. And then you go check the other end. And if you still have power there, they're on different circuits. Yeah. Because you can't, you can't always tell just by which lights went out. I've seen kitchens that were on three different circuits for the lighting. So, while I understand wiring troubles are an issue, getting a hard line to some place up your house is definitely an issue. This is not a good solution. This is a less than optimal solution. It's you're going to have an unreliable uh, network connection. You're going to have one that's going to be fighting to function. Um, 
it was it was sold just in this way. Hey, you don't have to be wireless anymore, except it's kind of snake oil. Yeah, it, it really it's 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 a solution for the routers normally right outside my room. But what they constructed this place of is blocking most of the signal. So I put one here and one six feet away from here. You know, hmm. and I'm good. I, I always kind of it's have, you'll notice it's never really caught on. And I've yeah. always really, I always viewed it more as a proof of concept device than a practical device. Um, it's, it's a very niche thing, and it, it, it working is very um, sort of niche as well. Now, I say this as someone who uh, whose router is due to the fact there's only one cable outlet in my entire uh, townhouse, um, whose router is very far away from his main computer. I had to run. A 75 foot cat six cord up the stairs, up walls, up along. That was my best option, and it's what I had to go with. It's not pretty. It's not, I have little stick on uh, zip ties along the walls to keep it up on the ceiling and off things. It's not the best option, but it's the most practical option. And it's probably your speediest option. Yeah, it's it's the most reliable in terms of transmission. That's that's my best solution for you, dude. I your, your, your other if you if you have to go back to wireless, your other option there is a couple of repeaters along the way. If, uh, yeah, I know they're tricky and, and uh, temperamental as well. On the plus side, a seventy-five foot Cat six Cat six cable, relatively cheap. Now, when you measure it, always. Add 10, 15 percent. Yeah. Because you'll end up going, oh, wait, it's going to be more convenient for me to go this way. And you go, oh, because you can always have a, a small coil of cable at one end and be fine, but it don't stretch. Yeah. So running a uh, running a cable is is relatively cheap because it's just a wire. It's not like five bucks. It may be more like along the lines of 20 or 30. But it's still just a wire. And at this point, I would go get Cat6 cable rather than Cat5e. Oh, no one uses Cat5e anymore. Nobody. But they still sell it. They still sell it, but nobody uses it. Um, so, yeah, the, uh, if a, a hard wire cable isn't a practical option, your only other best bet is a better router or, like Mike said, repeaters. They're not ideal, but they if you can get them set up right, and again, that's a pain in the butt, they do work. The, the, the best way, probably with if you go the uh, repeaters route, is to get one from the same company that makes your wireless router, because it's most likely to work well with it. I'll hand unless it, unless you, and let's install Netgear stuff, and then in case you're just, you know. I'll hand Apple this for their airport stuff. Um... They they at least had their shit together in terms of everything working properly and right. It wasn't always the best gear, but they had their shit together and making it all work together. Yeah. Had. I, they discontinued I, I, it, but... Yeah, I have a repeater uh, here. We don't use it very often. It's, it's when we need it for downstairs. But uh, it's from Asus, who made my router. Yeah. because they And it's the same, basically, family. So they work fantastically together. Uh, let's see. Let's go on to our next one. This is from Abstruse. Uh... I have a system in a standard desktop size tower. I bought a cooler master system that won't uh, cooler. This is for cooling that wouldn't fit the case. I can't afford another cooling system. What's the best way to keep temperatures down without spending a lot of money? Okay. Well, first thing I would do is determine that cooler masters return policy. They might be pretty cool and take it back. We'll yeah. certainly look at that. Um, as far as cooling, uh, you're looking at two options, basically air cooled or water cooled. Uh, air cooled is your easiest. Yeah, and cheaper. Um, Which is basically throw a bunch of fans in there. Now, the problem with uh, cooling in a lot of desktop cases is getting the size of the cooler to fit in the case. And not not all cases, while, while many older cases are still perfectly functional and will work with modern uh, motherboards and power supplies... They were not designed with large coolers in mind. And let me show you some of these. This is uh, probably the most popular cooler 
Um, the it, it's cheap. It works very well. Um, mo it, it, it's it's the best option a lot of people use because well, it's not a lot of money, but it has a, a very good performance. It's called the Cooler Master uh, Evo 212. Um, yeah, the Cooler Master Hyper 212 Evo. Um, in terms of price, it is relatively cheap. $35 for a cooler. However, it's also a big honking hunk of metal with two, with one to two big honking fans attached to it. You can see it right there. Yeah. And the problem comes in when you try and put this inside the case. The, and then you try to close the case. Yeah. The very top of it might not fit line up with the door on the side of your computer case. Yeah. I run into a similar problem with my computer case uh, mm -hmm. where with the cards I have in there, the case has spots for four fans mm -hmm. on the door. Yeah. But with the cards I have in there. Can't put the fans on. Put, can't put the fans. I can put three fans on. So what did I do? I put three fans on. Yeah. Um, th th this is, it's, it's a pain in the ass and I'm sorry about this. What you should do when you're, you're getting a cooler is you really need to measure the inside of your case. You, you've got to do, met. you have to do math. Pain yeah. in the butt, but you have to do math. Um, in this case, you're probably going to have to talk to Cooler Master about their return policy, and you may not be able to return it, so you may be out about 35 to... Or whatever you paid for. Whatever you paid In for. In which case, I would say, put it up on, you know, if it's if it's not beat up, if you didn't beat it up in the, in the process, put it up on eBay or Craigslist, yeah, you or might talk get some to your local computer shops and say, hey, can I trade this? Or you know someone who's needing something, you know. Um... You can find someone who will buy that off of you there, if it's not beat up. Now, I will say there are other makes of these that take into account uh, height of um, your, your computer case. Uh, Scythe does a pretty good job with these. Um, let's see if I can show you one off the top of my hand. Uh, on oh, top of my hand, top of my head. Um, it is a little more expensive, but it was designed to deal with precisely this problem. Uh, this, yeah, it's the, uh, the side shuriken. It lays down flat, which it's not the most ideal for cooling, but they overbuild it to compensate for it. And it does a pretty good job, and it does it fairly quietly. Now, you'll notice it is, at least from this one uh, manufacturer, a little bit more expensive than the Hyper 212. Um, but it's one of those things you have to look into. Another option you have, if you're able to do it, which not everyone able is, and you're willing to sink a little more money into this and disassemble and reassemble your computer is get a new case. Um, on which can sometimes be cheaper than buying a new cooling system. Yeah, but uh, in in any in either situation here, unfortunately, you're going to be losing money on this. I'm sorry yeah. to say it. You 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 unless they'll take a return, you're going to lose money. Uh, I hate saying it, but that's you really before you add a new cooler to your computer system, you got to measure it first. Yeah. Um, and to, by the way, to give you an idea. The, the cooling companies are finally cluing into the fact that, hey, we need to make these things uh, a little bit more, you know, fitting into what people have. Cooler Master, as we've been talking about them, has a new liquid cooling system out, which you can, you know, for your CPU, that goes, oh, it won't fit in here vertically. Undo this piece, undo this piece, rotate it, retighten, retighten. It's now a horizontal cooling system. Yeah, it's, it's good of them. However, those are in the hundred dollar range. Yes. Oh, yeah. They're hugely expensive. Because they're I know new. this from my personal experience, motherfucker. So they, they look really neat, and, I, and I'm, I'm sitting there going, 
huh, next time I build a computer. So I'm, I'm sorry for the bad news on this one, but that's just the reality. You're, you're likely going to have to return and rework because when you, there, there, there's no way to make a round peg fit in a square hole without a very big hammer, and you shouldn't be using a hammer on your computer. That's not a good idea. Um, Unless it's a Mac, in which case we don't care. Uh, let's see, what else do we have next? Uh, okay, this is from Metal Mario. Dear Nash and the other dude. Nash's boss? Question mark? I'm not really. No, no not, not really, really, no. I'm his producer. I, I, I provided him money. Yeah. Uh, something weird is going on in my browser's windows uh, when I explore the internet, namely Google Chrome. Oh boy, this is going to be a fishing expedition. Uh, I am, for some reason, having trouble downloading and uploading things. Everything else functions normally, but I've saved many a picture as I explored through Google Chrome. Now, the first time I save something, the Windows Explorer window acts normal, but next time it takes an eternity, literally hours, for the save window to pop up. I've tried deleting my browser history, but nothing changes. It's come to the point where I use Microsoft Edge instead of Google Chrome. What can I do to fix the problem? I've had similar things happen. I haven't had the hours. I have had it take a minute or so, whereas, you know, sometimes it's you know, instantaneous. I think in part it has to do with the folder you're saving stuff to. I haven't experimented with this. There are, if you Google search this issue, there are people going, well, we think it's this, and other people going, I tried that, it didn't work. Um, one thing you might try is have a temp location you save stuff to. But as soon as you save it, you move it out of there to wherever it's going to be. Because yeah. I think what's happening is Google Chrome is going, oh, here's this folder with all these pictures in it. I've got to process these and scan these. Because one thing Google Chrome does is when it's looking at pictures, it's trying to make sure there's not malware embedded in some of them. Mm -hmm. And so if it's going through all your, your, your library of pictures, it takes it a little while. Uh, another the, the the reason why this is a fishing expedition is there are so many variables here. Yes, so many I variables. Mean, it could be your hard drive is having to spin back up again. Mm -hmm. But if it's um, it's not though, because he's not having that issue with a different browser. So this is a Google Chrome specific issue. Yeah, there is uh, a flag you can take a look at in Google Chrome, and this is what my my searches since I got the question. Uh, some people, more people have had luck with this than other things. If you go to uh, Chrome colon slash slash flags, it'll bring up the, mm -hmm. the flags in Google Chrome and search on, uh, what was it? It was hyperlink auditing and click the disable for that and see if it speeds it up. Now, what this does uh, otherwise is uh, it may disable some tracking stuff that you have in there. So if sites are tracking you on how you do things, this might make some of that break. Oh, nice. You may or may not care about. Um, but that's the only that's the only one I found that people have found a little bit more consistent work with. Another thing you don't mention here is you don't tell us about the plugins you're using with Google Chrome. Um, a quick thing to do to test for this sort of thing is to go through and disable, first disable all your Google Chrome plugins and one at a time, turn them back on to see which, if any of them are affecting your save speed, the, the, the speed of that save as window popping up. Um, You've also deleted, you said you deleted your browser history. This might be another case of uninstall Chrome and reinstall Chrome, but the fact that Chrome carries profiles from one computer to another now might make that a dubious proposition at best. Yes, because if you've got Chrome on, say, your phone, your profile is still active on there, and I'll yeah. go, oh, yeah, I'll just pull it back down. Regardless, this is... This is one of those ones that you're just you're chasing little issues and trying to pull things. And it. this is why a lot of people, when they see problems like this, they'll just reformat Windows. <laughs> Not me. Not again. 
Well, this is why every big box store you take a computer to, if they see an issue like this, they'll 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 say we're going to reformat it because we don't have the time to troubleshoot this issue that's specific to your machine. Unless, unless they absolutely know what it is because yeah. they've seen it 90 times already. In this case, well, yeah, the, the we those are the best options we have to potentially fix this. And okay. there is one other thing, but mm. I think it's a I think it's a one off uh, fix. It'll only last until you run Chrome again for a while, uh, and that is uh, a WinSock reset. But even that is iffy because it's as Nash said, it's working under uh, Edge. Yeah. So if if it was really a windsock, I'm not even gonna say it anymore. If it, was, if it was a windsock issue, it'd be working under every, it'd be doing this under every. Yeah. So, good luck with it. We're sorry we don't have better, better ideas yeah, for you. Try that flag and 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 see if that helps any. Yeah. Um, and uh, I say Google search on it. My search on this was where was my search? Uh, if I'm, oh, I must have accidentally closed the window. I did the search in, because what I do is I search on it, and open my results in new tabs that way. Um, yes, ad block um, might be causing some issues. Mm -hmm. um, some Chrome security settings might be causing some issues. Uh, it could do this. Make sure your Chrome is up to date. Uh, and the way you do that is you hit the little three dots thing on the upper right corner and go to settings and then go to about. And it will scan to see if you're using the latest version of Chrome. And I'm not. So it's telling me I should relaunch anytime now, which will happen after the show. Uh, but do that. Check to make sure your plugins are up to date. Do all that stuff because it could just be something like that. You know, you could be using 10 versions ago. And that's your, your issue. Okay, let's see what we have next. Uh, Brad asks us, not that Brad, different Brad. I was wondering about your recommendations on antivirus programs. Currently use Norton, been doing me no wrong so far, but I want your opinions on what is the better antivirus programs. What do you use, I, if you don't mind saying what you use, or what do you recommend, or is Norton perfectly fine? Okay, I think before we say what's good, we can national agree on what you don't want. McAfee. McAfee, yeah. That is, that is Garbage, garbage. All right, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna outline a brief history here of how we got to where we are with antivirus programs. Um, originally, you had uh, Norton was pretty much the first big name in uh, Norton Solutions was the big name in antivirus back in the '90s, uh, followed by McAfee, and then other other uh, companies popped up like Avast and. Um, just, uh, AVG. AVG. AVG was a big one for a while there. And all of these programs were decent for a time. And then someone in the marketing department got involved. Um, we noticed this with uh, uh, Norton and McAfee first. Um, the, the selling of subscriptions became the thing selling uh selling you the antivirus updates to keep your system safe that that was their business model and as part of this business model it was really strange about a month before your subscription was due to expire not only would you get the pop-up saying hey your subscription's about to expire your computer would strangely slow down hmm. and then other things started coming in uh like they would try to make you if you just wanted the antivirus they would try to push you toward the other products and insist your computer wasn't safe without their firewall software too which wasn't true because you might be using someone else's firewall or you might not need a firewall at all and yet they kept trying to, and you would have these pop-ups every time you use software, you have all these pop-ups coming up at you that looked more like viruses than the fucking viruses. World of Warcraft is trying to access the internet. Do you wish to allow it? Uh, uh, yes, that's why I installed it. AVG uh, became particularly egregious about this to the point that 
what had been the one I would recommend to everyone, which was AVG for a long while there, became utter garbage of yeah. this cross-platform marketing shit they were trying to do. Yeah, I think it was AVG that if they would still give you AV, you could you can get AVG free, but unless you pay them for it, it won't automatically update. Yeah, you can go in there and manually update it, but how many people remember to do that on a daily or weekly basis? And what kind of broke the back of all of these was um, when Windows Defender came out. Uh, Windows itself, Microsoft, started offering an absolutely free antivirus program bundled with Windows. And several of these companies lost their freaking minds. Oh, yeah. There were lawsuits There was or threats of lawsuits. There was all sorts of grumbling and, and wailing and tearing of hair. Um, especially considering that currently... The modern version of Windows Defender, which handles both malware and viruses, is more than good enough for 99% of people out there. And it's absolutely free. It's already part of Windows. It and it's not bogging your computer down. Nope. It's very fast. It's, it's remarkably fast. It doesn't take forever to scan for viruses on my system. Even the slow, deep scan takes a relatively short amount of time. Yeah. Compared to how it used to be. I, I have a special time frame I use for the slow deep scan. It's called, I'm going to work. Yeah. Now, at this point, I would say you don't really need anything else. Now, I do like keeping stuff like malware bytes on hand because there are some things that... That get past the Defender for a little while. Yeah. Um, but not, when it at least in terms of malware. When it comes to a straight up virus... Windows Defender is Johnny on the spot. Uh, malware, and you have to understand, there are distinctions here between a virus and malware and other things. There are distinctions. Um, and, and by the way, your browser, say you're using Chrome, mm -hmm. also does a decent job of detecting these things and stopping you from actually doing stuff on sites that have these issues. Yeah. Not a perfect job, a decent job. So if you go, I, I have Google search on something, I want to go to this site, and your screen turns red and says, hey, um, this site's hosting a lot of malware. Are you sure you want to continue? That's when you should go, uh, no. Yeah, well, I will say there are some false positives on this. I've seen oh, yeah. some. There's, 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 there's plenty of false positives. Oh, no, there's enough false positives to be noticeable. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the, the last time I had one of those pop up, it was, hmm, I don't know if that's a false positive or not, but I can wait until the day after tomorrow when they clear this up to check on the update of this webcomic. It's not that critical. Now, I will point out, however, if if you're the t if someone's using your computer who's willing to click on every link that comes into your email and will believe when a pop-up starts screaming at you that Windows has detected a virus on your computer. It's very dangerous. You should call this number immediately for Windows support to fix your computer. If you're the type of if you're the type of person who cannot has no savvy whatsoever, you might want to consider paying for an antivirus. And if you know someone like that, change their account so they cannot install software. Yeah, yeah. That th those are those uh, what we call the classic PEBCAC issue. PEBCAC is an acronym that stands for Problem Exists Between Chair and Keyboard. Mm-hmm. And if it takes you a second to think about that. Um, so at this point, I, I, I honestly can't recommend getting anything other than uh, just what's built into. Now, if you're using uh, Linux or something, do we have a good recommendation for a Linux antivirus? Uh, I do not. Uh, I do know because I'm, I'm, I'm sure if I went to my Linux guy at work, and said, "Hey, what antivirus?" Because he's required to use antivirus. Yeah, it is. This is the this is the best part. His Linux machine is not networked. Any data that has to go onto that machine has to be scanned by an antivirus by another machine before it goes on a CD to go on that machine. But he still has to have antivirus on the Linux box. I I, I think because. Uh, cause I can never say it right. Kapersky, Kapersky, yeah, that they're they're Kapersky, they're, they're, or Kaspersky, or whichever it is. They they are pretty reputable. 
they I guess they would they would be the first one I talk about if we're talking about a non Windows system. Um, I don't even know what sort of antivirus to put on an o on a Mac OS system. No, not a clue, not a one. But for the for the longest time, there weren't really any Mac viruses, and the Mac people touted that oh, there's no Mac Mac is secure. There's no Mac viruses. It's because no one was writing them. Now they are. Now they are. They exist. I know a guy in college. He kept all his Windows viruses because he collected them on a Mac because they couldn't run there. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Finally, one uh, last one from Diego. Hey, Nash, Grady, Mike, and Mike Slant, which keep changing sides on the background. That's, that's a camera issue. It's finally time to charge my iPhone 5 since the battery uh, barely lasts me three quarters of a day. So I come to you for a recommendation for a new phone. Now, all I really care about on phone is web browsing and social media, so probably not much horsepower. What I do care about is having a case to put my cell phone in, protect it, and personalize it a little. So I'm looking for something that's popular enough to find a case. It would not be difficult. Thank you, guys, and, well, good luck with, with your Trump problem you have going on up there. Yeah, we well, need it. We need as, it. As far as uh, what phone to get, basically... If you want a nice cheap phone that has everything you need, look at what's just come out and subtract one number from it. Yeah. So, um, uh, if what's the Galaxy 7? No, 7. No! Not that one. That's one on fire. Um, no! Galaxy, Galaxy Edge 7? I personally, I wouldn't touch Samsung right with now, a yeah, 10. Probably tricky. Ever. Um, ever. No, no, no. All right. When it comes to Samsung, Samsung, they make fantastic hardware. Well, they used to until they started catching fire. But their software is a nightmare. It's rarely, if ever, updated. It's and on Android, it's heavily skinned. In the case of my Samsung television set, they actively removed features from it after I purchased it. And due to the terms of service, I had no recourse. So now I have no schedule grid on my television set anymore. That feature was removed. That's a smart TV. Um, Samsung, I wouldn't touch them. I've used Samsung in the past and they were okay. But now, uh, without putting on my own custom uh, ROM on it, I wouldn't touch Samsung to save my life. Um, iPhone, of course, is overpriced. In fact, most phones are really expensive. Um, I personally would look at right now because this is this is going to change but for right now 2016 right this second the nexus 5x and 6p yeah um they have plenty of cases for those because google put them out and google uh, supported them um they are really cheap compared to other phones you can get buy one up front for about 400 dollars us they're last generation, so you may have to look a, lot, a little bit online to find them, but they're still out there. Um, they're, rel they're relatively fast. They're about as good as the Pixel. USB-C, good features, and they have at least two years guaranteed updates with a whole lot of flexibility later. You could, you, if you're willing to take the custom ROM route, lots of people have custom ROMs for the, six, for the Nexus series. So that's what I would recommend. Now, there are other things out there like the uh, LG has a couple of relatively inexpensive mm -hmm. and decently powered ones. Um, you know, if you if you're looking at sub 200, they've got a couple models. Uh, HTC has a couple sub 200 models. The OnePlus series out there those are those are pretty good features, good price. I'm a little skeptical about their software because they are a Chinese-based company and they don't have the same kind of stringent regulations they, that we do. So I'm not entirely sure about what data is going where, how much you would trust that. That's up to you. If you're, again, if you're willing to go the custom ROM route, a great idea is to get a OnePlus, format the shit out of it, and put a custom ROM on it. Um, those are good because they, they the hardware's good and they're the price is good. But if you want the least amount of trouble, um, 
with the the cheapest price right now the the nexus 5x and 6p those yeah. that's your good bet and if you're an absolute masochist and decide to put yourself through a great deal of hassle there's the microsoft lumia 735 oh yeah those are cheap as shit right now because no one fucking wants them I, I don't know what you know you said you also you want to a, a case you can personalize. I don't know what the case situation yeah. for those is. So, um, that's just more of, you feel like beating yourself from head and shoulders to yeah. this phone. Now, the reason I, I wouldn't recommend the, the current model, Google Nexus, which has become the Google Pixel, it is way overpriced compared to the Nexus 5X and what you're getting. Way the fuck overpriced. There, There is no point in spending that much for that little gain. And it's, yeah. And the, the other problem is they, they went with the all glass thing, uh, yeah. which is just, that, that's just asking for trouble in the long run. Even if you get a case for that, you, why does the back need to be glass? Why does the back of the phone need to be glass? I suppose so you can, they can, can they, just, it's just glass or is it a little like low resolution display there too? No, there's no display on the back. It's just glass glass on glass to look pretty. See, if it was a low-resolution display, I'd be like, okay, that's kind of cool. But glass, no. 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 That, that's... Why would the fuck? What the fuck is wrong with you? Well, that's a different show. Well, anyway, that's going to do it for us tonight. Um, thanks for your questions. If you have questions for next time, we'll be back in two weeks. Send those to requests at radiodeadair.com. We'll do our best to try to help you out with your issues. Um, in the meanwhile, for Mike and myself, uh, this is Nash saying we'll uh, see you next time.